I'm Dina. And I'm Thomas. Um, and we're members. Oh, we're using the mic, oh, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we're members of Posit. Um, thank you guys for coming for our second live event. This is our first faculty, faculty feature. The last one was a new faculty exhibition. Um, so some of you guys know, Posit is a student-run digital multimedia platform for architecture students. We curate content of conversations related to architecture. Today we have with us Nicole McIntosh and Jonathan Louie of Architecture Office and Molly Hunker and Greg Corso of Sports, both winners of the 2017 Architecture League Prize. <laughs> So a brief introduction before I let them take it away. Architecture Office describes himself as a part practice and part observation. The work they produce deploys images to distinguish form from its assumed cultural associations. The project supports architecture's unique capacity to not um, be static and singular, but to be simultaneously engaging and refresh the real-time value of the things around it. Nicole McIntosh studied at the ETH Zurich in Switzerland and completed a teaching fellowship at the Tillerson School of Architecture in 2015. <clears throat> Jonathan Louie is a BArch graduate of Syracuse and an MArch graduate of UCLA. He was a fellow with the McDowell Colony for the Arts in New Hampshire. They are both assistant professors here at Syracuse University's School of Architecture. Okay, so sports is also an award-winning architecture and design practice consisting of Molly Hunker and Greg Corso. Uh, the practice strives to create, create spaces and objects that utilize the ideas latent in everyday phenomena, and the practice is rigorous and serious in research while maintaining amusement and curiosity. Um, so Molly Hunker and Greg Corso, they met in graduate school at UCLA and collectively have experiences at design practices such as Studio Gang, JDS Architects, Doug Aitken Workshop, and Talbot, Talbot Milan, Milanahan Architecture. Um, so a little bit about the Architectural League Prize. It's an annual theme competition aimed at designers that are 10 years or less out of their bachelor's or master's degree programs. Uh, the practice recognizes high quality, the prize recognizes high quality work and encourages the exchange of ideas amongst young architects. Um, so past winners include Young and Ayata, Andrew Holder, Norman Kelly, and Jimenez Lai. And so we're incredibly lucky to have this group of amazing designers with us here today. Um, you can see a curation of their work in the marble room behind us, where they've set up. Um, so now, Architecture Office and Sports will give short presentations before we open it up to questions to the general public. Um, so thank you, Dina and Thomas, and also to the rest of the POSIT crew for, for having us tonight. Um, it's been a pretty, pretty crazy ride since uh, this past summer, and we're lucky to be here to talk to you a little bit about um, some of the things that we've done. Um, so tonight we'd like to spend some time talking about what supports our practice, and also show a few ways that these things propel our work um, right now. Our installation that we installed in the marble room, Viewfinders, is named after the part of a camera that frames a view of a subject. With the installation, our intent was to expand the vis visitor's field of vision to reveal selections from our image archive, which we'll talk more about in a little bit. Each viewfinder is built as a combine of things that take on a new identity, a sun-packed traveling tripod, molded, molded plastic downspout fittings, Oops. Uh, gaffer tape and custom connections. Uh, we invite you to scroll through the select images, each one shifting the field of view to collapse other theirs with the here. Um, when thinking about the prompt for this year's uh, Young Architects Award, we could not help but to think about the images around us and how we gather, deploy, and actualize them um, to support our work. The title of our proposal for this year's prize, There, There, um, draws on, on the support of a pervasive image culture uh, to construct new designs that question the signification of a thing um, in relation to its intent. Um, images are a fu fundamental element in today's world, and we are now at the point where saturation of images causes to question the singular identity of a thing. Um, with this in mind, we consider the term there to be a singular place or position, and there there draws on the select uh, accumulation of multiple identities and disciplinary positions. Um, these are a few images 
images from our uh, archive. Each series frames the projects that are currently in our office. It's important to know that they are uh, grouped into regions and should not be looked at linearly. Also, the collections, of course, always uh, change and uh, we develop and uh, while we develop and refine our ideas. To help us better, to help us better explain our work, we'd like to share four observations on the way images make their way into our, into our projects. Uh, observation number one. Through literal representations and reconfigurations, our work aims to actualize images that both distinguish and deny form, material, surface, and structure of readily available things from its assumed disciplinary and cultural associations. For example, in the truss house, we are interested in the varieties of trusses as both structure and signifying element in the barn. While trusses typically are optimized for fit and performance, our project defamiliarizes the truss structure to differentiate the various programs within the cabin and to give interiors, the interiors of the one-story building uh, an unexpected look. Number two, um, we're interested in destabilizing the experience of images and things by displacing or interrupting their familiarity, be it context, materiality, or other characteristics. Often we are relay multiple images to do so. Um, an example of this is House in House, a single uh, family home that uh, reconfigures imagery of its immediate setting. Uh, the project collapses multiple views with significant features taken from the existing cabin on site, the neighboring houses, and projections of the environment. The ensemble of elements construct unexpected details that create an additional alienation from the expected image of a house. For example, by overlaying the paint on the half round shingle pattern, we create an exterior surface with two uh, significations, the suburban home and the imagery of the forests that surround the site. Number three, uh, images influence both the means and ends of our work, supporting the project's conception and also finding their appearance as part of the outcome. With Big Will and Friends, we redrew the popular Morrison Company thistle wallpaper into an inhabitable visual environment to suggest that wallpapers, collapse of illusion and material, are a problem where multiple forms of knowledge meet. While walls traditionally act as support for pictures to be hung, the installation blends the scrim wall with the painted pattern to blur the distinction between the qualities of the picture with the properties found in its architectural support. Uh, lastly, number four. Uh, to conclude, we like to mention uh, that our architecture office is both part practice and part observation. The ob observations are seen as concepts that drive our research and teaching and impact the ways we're developing um, as designers. For example, we're looking at images that are part of the building codes of European towns, um, European, American European themed towns. Um, in the case of New Glarus, Wisconsin, several Swiss uh, picture books construct the look of the village through the Swiss themed coats. The transcultural imagery in New Glarus is important to our practice in two ways. Our interest in image collection question um, not only the dare there as an urban setting, but also um, is a methodology that we're finding to situate our work in a world full of images. Like the things we've observed, we use images to construct new realities for commonly found materials and structures to distinguish it from its assumed disciplinary and cultural associations, supporting architecture's unique capacity to not be static and singular, but to simultaneously engage and refresh the things around it. Thank you. Okay. Oh, good. Um, thanks for, for staying late, guys. Um, as Jonathan Nichols described, the theme for this year's uh, Arc League Prize was support. And so um, they, they kind of talked about it in, in, in through the perspective of their office, and we'll, we'll kind of do the same for us. Um, 
So when we were considering the, um, this year's theme of support, we were sort of thinking about support as an ideological proposition. So where one might champion um, or cheer for a particular um, uh, idea, uh, strategy, solution, um, camp, or kind of legacy. And so um, in thinking about that, um, it's sort of similar how one might support a team um, out of tradition or sort of embracing the status quo uh, rather than maybe being critical of the merits of whether something should be rooted on or not. Um, and so our work in, in, in a way and the work and research that we do hopes to um, sort of challenge that and reject the idea of support in our case um, and focus on a more fluid way of operating in our studio. So uh, we are interested in a certain elasticity maybe to the built environment that allows us to um, embrace multiplicity novelty, um, discovery, and a variety of new forms of engagement. And so by leveraging um, uh, m multiple inputs, the projects hopefully um, start to discover discrete but other uses of uh, space, site, uh, material, and construction. And so in a way, our response to the, to the, to the theme was thinking of our work as not, um, as not in support of a particular team, but rather maybe just in um, favor of compelling plays or the, the kind of boundaries of the game. So um, as Greg mentioned, our work is interested in many things, so different things for different projects, but um, there's a few maybe relatively consistent themes that we're gonna kind of talk through, um, not so specifically per project, but kind of in general. Um, so the first is an exploration of how we can uh, leverage notions of material assembly alongside methods of fabrication to reinforce specific graphic and image-based qualities within a, a, a set of different contexts. So for many projects, the visual effect is paramount, but ultimately it's about how an architectural object relates to its context and also how it engages the people around it. So we think about material and fabrication systems um, and how they can be leveraged to produce image or spectacle while also implicating maybe blurry boundaries of use. So um, our recent project in Santa Barbara, for instance, which is one of these images as you're going through, that one, um, utilizes thin steel rods in a matrix organization and exploits the relationship between the simple geometric edge and the material density. So negotiating the experience of a clear expression of geometry and a blurry visual effect. Um, rounds, this, that last one, uh, the pavilion that we um, built with students north of Chicago utilizes material and fabrication in a slightly different way. So the project relies on digital fabrication systems to produce the internal structure that allows the conically curved form to exist, after which the whole system gets clad in smooth bendable plywood and then smeared in elastic meric stucco to appear as something simple and monolithic despite its fairly complex structural logic within. Um, architecture can, of course, reinforce uh, kind of common uses and behaviors and be sort of functionalist, made increasingly efficient to host those uses. Um, but we're maybe interested in something that kind of transgresses architectural function um, and the power that that has to challenge our understanding of what is the kind of normal or understood use of a space or object. Um, so we recently had the opportunity to build these two pavilion projects, which is an architectural typology of great interest to us in that it doesn't have, or it's sort of freed from many of the, the kind of um, functions that we might understand of larger buildings, um, but still exists at a large enough scale where they implicate uh, engagement with the human body directly through ideas of use or misuse. So in some projects we pursue this idea um, uh, through focused but unspecified function, so a kind of precise ambiguity or specific vagueness, where the features of an overall form are specifically designed to the scale of the human body and a variety of ways in which the body can engage with the surface. Um, so rounds the, the, this project um, as an example of that. While in other cases, there is an effort to combine ideas of geometric kind of orientation and changing organization or arrangement, such that um, an object or a series of objects develop different uses um, and have renewed existences. So this Santa Barbara project, um, part of its brief was that it moved around the city um, over, uh, over a year. And so um, uh, it's traveling to a bunch of different sites and, and develops renewed transformation. 
So while that's been particularly interesting and fun for us to see in person, um, I think what's been even more interesting is, is through social media. So these are all Instagram um, posts of, of this recent Santa Barbara project. Um, no one's telling these people that they can use these pieces in particular ways or not use them in particular ways. So it's been really fun to see kind of how people engage with them um, and, and fold that back into kind of our next series of projects um, that we'll go on to produce. And so um, in addition maybe to some of the uh, architectural ideas of material fact and, and um, uh, maybe programmatic use, we have an interest in the representation of our work. So um, there's, these are two exhibitions from this summer that are um, that are display our work. Um, and the first one is this one, um, which was interested in looking at how uh, the work or how a, how a project actually exists in the world. And so, um, which is really this kind of curated representation. And if we build off of thinking beyond the proliferation of the image and blogs and books or, or the internet um, to thinking about the kind of consumer artifact as a potential conduit of dissemination and um, representation of, of, uh, of, a, of a work or a project and how it might actually start to um, live in the world that way in the context of perhaps a culture interested in immediacy and accessibility of, uh, of ideas. Uh, so we sort of created a, a shop um, that actually Thomas was our clerk for the night um, in, in Los Angeles where we sold a bunch of uh, artifacts that build off of a, uh, that lineage of thinking about representation and how the project can actually have a life beyond the actual existence of the work in addition to um, a different bent on the image of the project. Um, and then also the Arc League exhibition, which is pictured there, and the, some of the artifacts are sparsely displayed in the, in the marble room. That was interested in maybe tapping into those ideas we were talking about at the beginning, that more emphasize our ideas of support, which is a, maybe a more multi-layered approach to our projects, hopefully, um, in which these artifacts here um, are kind of model drawing hybrids that try to collapse a number of ideas, um, whether they're uh, kind of formal, programmatic, contextual, um, temporal, all of that information sort of um, laminating into, uh, into one artifact for each of the projects. So that's what we have in there. All right. So now, yeah, so now we're going to open it up to sorry, uh, questions from uh, social media that we've received. Um, nice. So, go ahead, go ahead. This is a question for both both practices. So, having lived in larger cities, how has being uh, how has being in a Syracuse-based practice affected your work? Uh, so. I think that's an interesting question because uh, in many ways, um, well, Nicole's from Switzerland and I'm, I'm from the West Coast, or farther west than the West Coast. And um, um, I, I would say that a lot of our projects are actually not based here in Syracuse. And, and so we, we actually spend a lot of time uh, communicating um, our works through different platforms as well as flying out to deal with our uh, clients and consultants in, in places such as Minneapolis or Seattle. Um, and, and so in many ways, uh, while well, Syracuse is our home base and we, we love kind of uh, um, developing our ideas here uh, in Syracuse um, and you know, working with John Bryan down in the woodshop to help to kind of fabricate some of our ideas or, or mock them up, um, we, we don't really see ourselves as a Syracuse based, based practice. Um, and for us, um, I think it's been really helpful to kind of diversify the critique and um, help us develop kind of uh, uh, new and different ways of looking at the work and developing the work. Um, so, you know, we were both trained at UCLA and I think felt very much a product of the kind of architectural um, educational scene of the West Coast. Um, and as we've moved further east, um, first we were in Chicago and now here, um, we've come up a 
uh, uh, come, come up upon kind of new modes of operating and new things to think about in Syracuse, particularly the kind of history and tradition of the school um, and the places that uh, other faculty come from has been a tr of tremendous value to us in terms of um, uh, bringing in different perspectives and sort of challenging the way that we yeah, can develop our practice. Um, not to mention the, the incredible support that we've received here. Um, uh, and I know you guys, we're all in this boat together. It's, it's amazing uh, for young faculty at the school um, uh, in terms of kind of supporting the, the direction and development of, of our practices. Okay. Um, how did you come up with the firm, with your firm names and or project names? This is a question for you both. Um, that answer changes every every time we're asked. Uh, so, um, I, for, we, sports was it was uh, was something we were interested in as a name because I guess we wanted something that was um, that tried to speak to maybe our relationship with design. And so, on one side, you can understand it through a lens of playfulness and curiosity and um, um, kind of experience and then on the other side that notion of sports being grounded in r rules and parameters and um, a certain sense of rigor to it so um, I guess we kind of thought of ourselves as somewhere balancing that and thought that would be a good end we didn't want to use our names. I mean, that was very similar for us in that sense that we didn't want to really use our personal name because we think that what we do together is very different than, not very different, but different than what we would do individually. And so it was clear for us too from the very beginning that we wouldn't use our names. Um, also just the fact that hopefully the office is a long life kind of commitment and that people change over time. So we didn't want to be bound on, on any kind of personal uh, thing, but I, I mean, the truth, how we came up with the name was uh, we had a potential client in LA and we were, I was still in Arizona and Jonathan was here in Syracuse and um, the person who uh, kind of uh, was the person in between to communicate asked us to, uh, so what, what our name was and it was like, I don't know, one o'clock in the morning and we were drawing the, the house in house and like, I don't know, I mean, whatever, you know, like, I, I guess we could be architecture office. And so <laughs> we like the name because, yeah, I think it's pretty straightforward what we try to do. Um, yeah. Well, I, I, I would also say that uh, uh, everything that we try to do is pretty straightforward and, and the, the kind of... Uh, the way we like to play with the, the words that are in the world that we live in um, uh, kind of produce different kind of uh, identities over time. And, and so we just try to kind of uh, sh uh, strip everything down to what it is and, and just let multiple interpretations kind of do what they do. Sorry, really quickly, that also goes for the project names, right? So it's a house in a house, it's a trust house, it's pretty straightforward. Okay, uh, so the next question is for architecture office. So when first conceptualizing the house in house project, at what stage in the design process did you compartmentalize a new rendition within the existing one? What inspired this move and in what ways do you think it improved the overall design? So I think, um, so at, at the point where we started working on it, the question was, okay, well, what do we do now? And I think for us, it's, there is always something there, you know, so I guess the idea that we um, use some sort of an existing uh, condition on site, so it's not only that the house or the existing cabin that informed the house and house uh, concept, but also like the, the surrounding uh, forest and so on. So I think we're, we were uh, desperately looking for something we could make part of the design and the cabin unfortunately wasn't really, I wasn't, I mean it's a, it's a typical uh, Pacific West uh, log cabin and has certainly values in terms of preservation 
but it was not, a, we couldn't integrate it because there was no foundation or anything and so we, we planned to take it apart and store it somewhere else and then just built um, a house in a house that had a similar footprint and the idea of a very um, efficient floor plan um, where you could eventually just uh, take away the outer house and it would still function as a house because all the, all the necessities are basically part of that house. We also like the idea. We also like the idea of uh, giving somebody two houses for the price of one. Okay, this next question is for sports. Um, what was the inspiration behind the runway project in Santa Barbara, and how did this idea inform the design process? Um, so this project was through a competition that the Museum of Contemporary Art Santa Barbara ran, and so in competition projects, I think more than perhaps more than, than client-based projects, um, concept is super important and kind of like, uh, in this case, Santa Barbara um, is really interested in um, kind of reinforcing uh, an identity that is separate from elsewhere in Southern California. Um, and so one of the things that we became really, uh, I mean, we had, had uh, been to Santa Barbara many times, and um, one of the things that makes it uh, really special to us was the way that um, the kind of fog works, um, so that the kind of air quality and how the city is constantly blurry, and um, sort of the fog kind of comes in and erases the edges of buildings and makes trees disappear and reappear, and um, it was just a, a like Santa Barbara kind of specific quality that we were interested in sort of figuring out how we could make a kind of material system have that same effect. Um, so we yeah, designed these really sim simple uh, geometries that um, are all the same and um, just made them out of a material system and fabrication system that hopefully would sort of achieve that, that kind of blurry effect. And so um, depending on sort of your point of view and how far away or how close you are, um, you get either more of a registration of the kind of geometric edge um, and sort of clarity or a sort of complete like color blur. Um, so that's, yeah. Yeah, and I think also the idea that uh, the museum's intention was to move the project around to different sites in Santa Barbara. So that to us, I mean, this is kind of a lesson for the kind of problem being an opportunity. That to us wasn't interesting at first. Um, and because it seemed to evoke a, a project that was about purely construction and assembly. Um, and so, but then as we started to explore it, this idea about actually making a singular object that can actually be rearranged and have specificity depending on the conditions that it's in uh, became really interesting to us and to start to marry those two ideas. So it was actually some of the things they were looking for in the brief uh, that originally uh, weren't the first things we were looking at ended up being the things that were most interesting to us when we developed it. Okay, so for architecture office, within your design processes, is there a difference between the process for temporary installation work versus uh, for permanent architectural work? And is there overlap or does one inform the other in any way? Um, so, so one of the things that we're um, constantly fascinated with in, in the world around us is, is the way that um, the value of, of the same thing can, can always be changing. And it doesn't matter if it's, say, generation to generation or year by year or even second to second. And, and I think that's something that's um, drawn together uh, our installation work from, say, uh, the kind of perceptual qualities of big will that change over, say, the day um, versus, say, some of, some of the ways that we start to think about some of the, the built work that we're doing. Um, we have a, a restaurant that will be opening in January or February, if, if all goes well. And um, we, we've set it up as a series of kind of frames and planes and stages. And um, we, we hope to um, show you guys that in a little bit. I mean, I think the, the great thing about the installations or the, the smaller things is that we're able to build them pretty fast and we're able to test our ideas. With a project like House in House and uh, like clients, it's uh, ho and you know consultants and people who build it for you. I mean, it's just a different. It's it's a longer process, and sometimes it's just 
in the middle of the process things change again and I think with the with the installations it's mostly that we do what we feel is right while with the build projects it's often that there is a certain compromise that you that we're either willing to take or not to take and so I think it's just a different process in that sense how long it takes and how how who is involved in it yeah, I have to say, um, within the, the design and building process with the client, uh, rhetoric makes a, makes a huge difference. So uh, how, how you can kind of develop a concept and how you can sell the concept may sometimes align with each other and may sometimes not align with each other. So what I mean by that is um, how we can start to kind of uh, develop an idea which is of interest to us, uh, but then be able to kind of uh, tell a story that, that is of interest of the client so that everybody's a winner or everybody thinks they're a winner. And I think, I mean, this sounds strange a little bit, but um, we agree on the fact that if we have to compromise too much, we rather not do it than just doing something that someone else wants us to do, I think. Okay, this question is for sports. Um, why do you define yourself as designers? And what is your distinction between architect and designer? Okay, so <clears throat> I feel pretty strongly about this and I'm, I'm actually kind of horrified by this question in general. Um, I feel like all architects should define themselves as designers. I think mo most do probably. Um, I think in terms of the way we think about ourselves as designers, um, it has to do with our training, which was uh, extremely design focused. And um, I think it just uh, speaks to a sort of focus within the discipline. So um, certainly not all designers are architects, particularly in terms of licensure. Um, and not all architects may be designers, although I would say probably most are, but not all. Um, and so they're not, they're not mutually exclusive terms. You're not either a designer or an architect, right? Um, so which is what kind of horrifies me uh, about this question is that it sort of positions itself that way. Um, but yeah, it just speaks to kind of the way we think of ourselves in terms of the, the focus we have, the things that are, um, that were, that, that are, our kind of ambitions within architecture um, are very focused on, on design um, and sort of, uh, yeah, understanding our role that way. Yeah, and legally, we can't say that. Yeah, and also, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> not, not in this country. <laughs> Okay, so this is a question for both of you. Um, what project to date has been the most fun to work on and why? Well, th th this, that's easy because we're in S S Slocum right now. Um, we, so I have to say it, because um, they may be in the audience, that we did the, the Ragdale Ring project, the Rounds project, um, was a design build and it involved a residency for, for four weeks at the the um, foundation to build it, so we took a bunch of students um, with us and built it with them for uh, those four weeks. So that was that was super fun, and it was really great to be a part of knowing where you know every single screw went and them seeing that, and um, so it was a lot of fun to work with the students in a more hands-on way. I don't. Um, I don't have. I don't. I don't know. Honestly, like we usually have a lot of fun with every project, and if it's not fun anymore, then we have to question what we're doing and if we're doing that, if if it's really worth doing it. Um, I, I would say that. I think um, maybe, like at least for me, one of the most uh, essential projects um, in the last two and a half years were, was definitely the house in house because I feel like. Um, before we did competitions or installations, but nothing really in that size and complexity. And uh, we also never had to uh, have a client uh, or client meetings with anyone. And so I feel like we worked through a lot of issues that we had and uh, together as designers or, uh, no, I can't say architects, I guess, um, but uh, to, to, to kind of figure, figure out what we want and especially what we want together to have, because it's a longer commitment, so we both felt like, okay, we 
have to figure out what we are, who we are, what are we doing now. And so I feel like uh, the house and house was very was a very good experience, at least for me, in order to understand that I can work with Jonathan. Um, and yeah, I think that's. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, Nicole and I, we, we've only been working together for about two and a half years, so um, it's, it's been a kind of pretty incredible roller coaster, mostly ups, um, and, and uh, hopefully always pointing up, no? <laughs> but uh, but I, I would say um, the nice thing about House and House was, was the fact that we would always um, uh, be able to find opportunities within the constraints that were delivered to us by, say, the client or the site. Okay, this question is for sports. Um, is there a method behind the colors that you choose to use on projects, and then how do they respond to the people viewing them? Uh, I'm not I don't know about method. Um, we, we use color a lot, and we think about color a lot. Uh, and we experiment with color a lot. Um, so um, we think about palettes, and we think about context. Um, so a lot of the color use has to do with um, what I was talking about earlier in terms of understanding the kind of material assembly um, and its resulting visual effect in a particular context and how it can either blend into that context potentially, like in the case of the, the Rat Ragdale project, or um, really differentiate itself, um, like in the Santa Barbara project. Uh, the goal of the museum was about spectacle, so um, something that really sort of uh, 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 produces a really strong juxtaposition. Um, so I think that's that's the way we kind of ultimately choose our palettes, but um, but I mean we're just we're always thinking about um, and constructing different palettes. We have a whole set that we haven't ever used in a built project that are just like waiting to you know find find the right form. Okay, uh, and then this question again is for both offices. Um, how do you believe social media has impacted your work and the way that you design? And has it helped you determine if a project is successful? I'll, I'll start that. Um, uh, since I mentioned social media earlier, um, uh, it's been really strange, actually, um, to, to have that as a representation of your project, especially when um, we're not working locally. Um, and so, like I mentioned for the Santa Barbara project, it's been really, really interesting to see what people do to the project when no one's around. Um, but uh, uh, it's also been interesting as we've talked to um, clients and developers often a kind of Instagrammable moment is a stipulation of a project. Um, and that's, that's been an interesting uh, thing to wrap our minds around in terms of um, how do you start to differentiate kind of moments in a project that, um, you know, for us it's, it's uh, and I think for many of us, it's not about Instagram or any particular social media, um, but it's about a moment that really engages people to the extent that they want to kind of stay there longer, um, they, they want to kind of say they've been there, that kind of stuff. And so how do you start to think about the things that are um, the, the reasons that people Instagram things, how do you fold that, that like level of engagement um, into your project in particular ways so that they have a sort of renewed um, uh, feeling uh, as, they, as they kind of move through it? Um, so, uh, well, I think when we gave a presentation, we did talk about the kind of role of, of images in uh, the world that we live in today, and, and certainly we are um, um, very interested in, in how we start to view and see things, um, how a hashtag works, how, how Instagram kind of like aggregates things. Um, uh, but, but I have to say that in terms of uh, in terms of our um, our work, like it's well, it, it drives a lot of the kind of thinking around um, the actualization of images or, or thinking of objects. Um, I don't know about you, Nicole, but um, I'm I'm a little horrified at at the idea of a kind of 
Instagram moment, that that uh, a kind of a project of so much complexity, complexity and and thought could um, be distilled down to something that's uh, you know 500 pixels by 500 pixels. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, maybe the, the second question is also interesting in relation uh, to the first one, right? So do we really determine if a project is successful because it gets published or not? And of course, publication helps, but I also think that um, that projects can be successful in just like like being happy about what you're doing and, and being able to, to actually articulate what you're doing and being proud of of what you've done so far, so I don't think that <laughs> that uh, only through publication the project is, or, or our success as a team is really is really about that. But of course, it helps. I mean. Okay, this is for obvious for both of you. Um, both of your office offices operate with just two people. How do you see your practice evolving? Do you aspire to eventually become a larger? Um, office and take on larger scale projects, or do you prefer staying small? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I, well, first of all, I think we always have like interns who help us, um, but also like, I mean, we work with a lot of people um, that are part of the project, right? That that are like planners or or people who build actually the work we're planning, and so I. I I often feel like it's not just the two of us because a lot of times a lot of other people have a saying and we have to figure it out as a team what we're doing to in order to like be able to produce something really nice. Um, Jonathan mentioned John, Brian downstairs who is helping us sometimes with the installations we're doing and so on so we consider um, like everyone part of that team so if you know in the end it's, it's about producing something that everyone is happy with. Um, yeah, and we're we're actually really enjoying that too. We're enjoying to have like different different planners for for a project like the cabin we're building in Seattle. Uh, that's a very different circumstance than we have in Minneapolis with a in a city where we build. So it's it's just always different, and and we we kind of enjoy it. Sometimes it's a little, you know, a, a lot. Like Jonathan mentioned, there's a lot of communication going on, but but I think. Other than that, we, we don't see us as just the two of us. Um, yeah, I, I, think, um, I think we do have an interest in working on larger, more complex projects. Um, and yeah, right now it's mostly us, so I don't know. We'll, we'll let you know how that goes. <laughs> uh, um, in a sense of, like, I think those are just new challenges that we'd, we'd be facing. We do work with some students. Um, that is super helpful um, to keep the conversations uh, more lively than just what, what's normally at stake for us. Um, and, and, and also, it's similarly, less about like employees, but opportunities, you know, particularly recently, some conversations we've had about collaborating with people or bringing us on for a particular, um, maybe more peripheral role, but sort of, sort of embedding our voice within a project has really been a, um, and a nice development and a potential uh, sort of trajectory for some of our works so how we can sort of um, uh, jump into uh, maybe larger projects uh, in a different way than, than taking them on as, our, as ourselves if, if that's not the opportunity in front of us. Okay, uh, so that was the last of our social media questions. We can open it up now to audience questions. Um, if and yeah, we'll bring the mics to you. Hello. So first of all, thank you guys for this awesome event and thank you professors for your presentations. Um, this is a question for Architecture Office. Um, you were talking about how you like to destabilize ideas and perceptions. I was wondering if you destabilize them so that people have a particular different, a particular view of that idea, or is it just like destabilize so that they figure out things for themselves? And if they do destabilize it to like figure it out for themselves, how do you make it so that it is not automatically assumed to be a particular different idea? 
Uh, so, Addy, if I understand what you're what you're trying to say is, um, in in a world where every almost everything goes, or in a discipline where it seems like almost everything goes, how do you start to kind of uh, focus or frame uh, a project so that your your message or your voice gets across relative to our interest in things? I was wondering if you were like uh, you wanted it to focus onto a particular thing or keep it more open to interpretation. Mm -hmm. and how you work around that? Uh, yeah, no, I think that's a really good question, no? Um, and, and one of the things that uh, we've observed uh, more recently, or I guess has always happened, is, is uh, oftentimes it's the same thing kind of uh, takes on different cultural values based on, say, uh, who's looking at it or its, its location in the world. Um, and, and, and in a way, that's... Um, that's something that we're willing to embrace in, in our work, and we're willing to try to start to kind of uh, uh, swerve, swerve, let's just say, a typical or traditional understanding of what that, what that thing is to be able to offer new, new opportunities. Um, and in many cases, uh, we try to, uh, I feel like one of the things that we, we try to do is we always try to kind of like collect images around that thing, whatever it is. Uh, and those images could be uh, from architecture, the architectural discipline, or from other disciplines like painting or sculpture, or photography, or movies. And, and that helps us to kind of develop an idea for uh, how we want to kind of approach or tackle the project relative to, to its outlook. All right. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, just to, to uh, add uh, something really small, but like I think there's always this point where we start looking at something very particular, and that is there, right? So, so it is like something that exists, and then we departure from that, like uh, let's say either through other imagery or through overlaying laying imagery or through um, drawing. Um, to defamiliarize that image or so, so it's re I mean, I think it's really different and it's probably much more complex that we also can't really explain what exactly is happening. I think that's what we're also interested in, in also in the teaching part more, more than ever. How can you use like images in a, in a methodology uh, or a method applied for, for like architects to design? I think that's... Uh, so first of all, thank you both for uh, all for this event. Uh, this question is for both of the office. Uh, is that how do you select the project that you do, and how important do you value the buildability of the project? Let's say if they're not, if you know that they're not going to be realized in the physical world, does it affect that, like the way that you design it? And Uh, I think that's a really good question for young offices. Um, uh, not because we have a lot of opportunities, but because we have to kind of figure out how to do our work, right? Like, so are we entering a bunch of competitions? Are we trying to get clients? Are we yeah, working with others to finagle something? Are we doing idea, speculative kind of things? Um, uh, so you have to make your own way in terms of what you want to develop um, and a kind of trajectory that you envision for yourself um, and I think that it's kind of always changing or there's always kind of adjustments to that course. Um, for us, uh, we have only done, I think, one ideas competition, a competition that was um, explicitly not about ultimately getting built. Um, and so the, the part about buildability for us is really important because we have specific interests in kind of material assembly and fabrication systems. Um, we have thus far specifically um, gone after projects um, and, and entered competitions that A, we think we could win, and B, that the product will be built. Um, and so uh, we have not won a lot of competitions. Um, uh, so we have a lot of accidentally speculative work. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but, um, 
all of those could be built at any moment. Um, no, but but you know we re we really are like I think the crux of, like what we're most proud about in our work is that the built product is better than kind of our renderings of it or then our drawings of it. Um, like what we envisioned and what we were able to represent digitally in the proposal of the project pales in comparison with what the actual project um, is, at least to us, um, hopefully to everyone. Um, so, uh, so that, yeah, so that's kind of what makes our decisions or has. Who knows? As we move forward, I mean, things, it really is a constant adjustment in terms of the trajectory and sort of how, how you build, like how you, how you are building a path that kind of allows you to get the next project that you want. And so, um, as I think all of us are, are potentially interested in larger scale work, um, how do you sort of do the, the, the small scale that leads you to the medium scale and then the medium scale that leads you to the next thing and, you know, so it's always kind of an adjustment. Um, I, I actually forgot the question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, qu the question is how important do you value the buildability of the project that you choose? And if that affects the design? Um, well, uh, actually, I, I would say uh, one of the things that is important about our office is not just the kind of uh, being able to put stuff in the world, but also being able to observe the stuff around us that, that in some way um, in, informs what we put out into uh, the world around us. Um, and I think New Glorious, Wisconsin is, is a good example of that, where um, that's, a, that's a research project. and, and um, we actually were just there uh, a couple of weekends ago. Um, we, we flew to Minneapolis and met with our clients in Minneapolis, and then we, we, we took a road trip to, to New Glorious and, and uh, spent a spent night documenting the work. And, and so, uh, well, right now, our observations uh, in many ways um, conceptually drive our work. Um, I, I think, uh, or the hope is that that we'll be able to kind of bridge our bridge our research more directly with with the kind of built stuff that we put out there in the world. Yeah, I mean, I think I think we try. Um, I mean, we're, we're hoping to build the projects we are planning, but we, you know, you never know. And I feel like that it shouldn't be again what I said before. I think that as as soon as the compromise gets too big and you're not able to be proud anymore of what you're doing or, or think like you're you're doing the right thing, then I think it's better not to build anything than to to build something you can't really because it, it is a lot of work and, and I mean luckily we have a teaching position here that allows us to to uh, to kind of do what we want to do, which is really fantastic. So I think maybe we have a little bit of different approach because of that than like architects who, who are just in practice. I think also um, in some of these, you know, accidental speculative projects, um, or not knowing if the kind of the fruition of it will happen. I think in as you work in offices, you'll know that offices don't, um, you know, just kind of shelve things to when they're done with a competition. That things have um, ways of working themselves out into other projects, or sort of forming other projects, or a part of a longer line of inquiry that can they can embed themselves in at a later point or make a lot of sense for something and have a new life. So um, it, it, it ends up um, being super informative for future endeavors uh, often. Do, do, you think there's a, do you think there's a shelf life to a, a project? <laughs> what does that mean? Uh, like like in, terms of, in terms of an idea or... Not or ours, research. but uh, no. Uh, <laughs> Well, I mean, I mean, there could be a million things that you are sort of slicing a project in a way, whether it's an interest in a material or it's an urban kind of agenda that you have that you're interested in. So,
Great presentations, thank you. Um, I guess I'm interested, I want to return to the, the issue of the image in contemporary culture, I guess in the status of the subject in the respective works. So for architecture office, you might imagine the work to be situated between typological thinking, sort of primary forms, primitive huts, grids, work that wasn't shown, um, but primary forms of houses, and um, an interest in, in, I guess, optical effect. Um, and by virtue of the optical effect, um, in a way, transforming or misregistering things that, that are known produce a certain kind of subjecthood. At least that's how I would read it. Like an awareness of both oneself, but also the, the icons that you're putting in play and sometimes using typology to stabilize, sorry, I'll quit in a minute. Sometimes use kind of typological form to, to stabilize the project and sometimes use typological form to animate the project. So the former being the kind of primitive hut with the, with the scrim, the latter being the truss in motion. Um, I, I guess for, for sports, I see it as both also interested in optical effect and in some, in some ways, by virtue of that, an interest in image. Um, and certainly the people are interested in the project in order to produce images. But it seems to me that the, the um, and something that you emphasize is the kind of bodily engagement of the, of the installation work. Um, and so in that sense, it seems to me that, that um, if you will, the, the resurrection of the, of the subject is through sort of direct bodily engagement with the stuff. So I guess I, I use that and then want both offices to, to uh, talk a little bit about the relationships between simply optical effect and, and a kind of uh, greater subjectivity or subject, subjective engagement of the work. So, so um, Ted, Ted, if I understand what your, your question is asking, um, uh, it seems to me that you're trying to draw, you're drawing, drawing a parallel in the way that both of us start to, both offices utilize, uh, let's just say, um, uh, questions around, let's say, like um, graphics or the pictorial arts relative to uh, the means and ends of, of the development of our work and how it's, um, not not just how it's received, but what it what it does relative to our kind of larger interest. Is that is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, I I think one of the things that I um, I, I would um, say um, yeah, typology is a word that I don't think we we totally uh, classify uh, our work around, um, mo mostly because it's. Um, Got a, got a certain, say, a series of rule sets and, and lineages that um, are a little uh, too formal for, for our take or our interest. Um, more, more so, I think we would say um, there, there are things that, uh, like, just not informal, but say cultural, cultural values around something that, that start to inform how we look at, look at it. Um, but, um, Issues and problems have been have recently been put on the table, uh, which which may be a little more say discipline specific to to architecture or to uh, like painting or something, and and I would I would say that's something that we're, we we've been pretty interested in recently. Not not just not in like uh, taking on somebody else's problems, but more so um, we think that there are say ideas and projects in the in the world that. We, um, that are not finished, um, and that we can kind of uh, kill, keep building upon. So, so um, instead of typology, we would try to keep building upon upon these these things. Um, in terms of, in terms of graphics and imagery, I, I think that's a really interesting way to kind of. Um, I don't know. It's 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 in some way a, a kind of something that's embedded in us. Uh, at least at least for. Uh, as, a, as a kind of, um, uh, not an intuitive act, but it's something that we just kind of like always start to think about. And, and, but I, I think 
as we move forward, we will start trying to find other, other strategies no? for, for how to start to engage the structure or, or the overlap of, of uh, image and the physical world in, in different ways. Um, I don't know if I can give you a better answer than that. Um, well, I would, I mean, in, in a way, I don't, um, I don't know if you, you, we would necessarily uh, parse it that way with, I, I think it all is a composite of a bunch of layers of the project. So the way that maybe it's engaged with an image, or I think for us, you're kind of talking about the production of an image rather than it as a generative notion. Um, and how that can actually, I think, just be by virtue of other factors that are of interest to us. So the, the way that things might be visual effects, but those start to bleed into some of the other, like in the recent pavilion projects, the, the, the actual kind of like image of use or the image of, which is already a really subjective thing, you know, in, in particular, like I think of our Santa Barbara project, if we're just talking like the production of the image for that, we, we hired a, because of the project was based on, um, sort of derived from an idea about atmosphere and air, we, we hired a, actually a, a nature photographer to take it. And so there was a totally uh, different lens to see that project for us because it was very clear he wasn't an uh, photographer of buildings or the built environment in a way, and a totally different way of looking at it. So in some ways it sort of bleeds into being productive for us on the, on the back end, as well as being um, kind of an externality of perhaps all of the factors that we're interested in working through in a particular project, or hopefully are. And then I, I, I was thinking about the, the question of the subject. Um, and I, I'm not, I'm not really sure about this, but um, it, it kind of uh, made my mind go to. Um, we're very cognizant of the fact that we're trained in a particular way, whatever that way is. And so a lot of our uh, mentors in graduate school were sort of at the time really interested in matters of sensation. And so I think we emerged from an understanding of uh, kind of sensation and effect. Um, being related to engagement. And so um, I think like the visual effects that we're after and the kind of um, programmatic use or misuse that we're after are very related um, and, and rely on the subject. Um, because I, like, I was wondering to myself like the kind of if a tree falls in the forest, does, it, you know, does anyone hear it? Um, the, the like, if, if our project isn't seen or isn't used, kind of, is it still the thing? Um, and I, I don't know that I have an answer for that <laughs> right now, but, um, but I think that the, the, the kind of the way that one engages, whether that's a visual engagement or a physical engagement, um, is very important to the way that we develop projects and the way that we think about our work, um, which for us really situates, because we're, our work obviously is sort of bordering, uh, it's on a line between art and architecture, and so for us that's what it make, what makes it clearly architectural um, and not just these pieces that uh, uh, people kind of observe, but that engages people and changes their behavior in particular ways. So uh, maybe just to follow up, I mean I think one thing is really interesting is that um, you're all like trained or went to the same grad school while I'm coming from a different different uh, background in that sense that very far away but at the same time not so far because I also got trained for a lot of like designing through imagery and maybe more so in relation to history than and, and, and a place. Um, I would say at the ETH that's very dominant but like I think there there's there is like a common common kind of like ground where we where we at least start to work at or on, upon on and and like again for us it's it's different in terms of like maybe a sensation and, and memory maybe in terms of an image but I think I think uh, yeah there is maybe maybe it's a certain like time time thing that we live in a generation where that's the case where we have to think about these things because otherwise we can't really do what we want to do. 
I mean, the, the, the Instagrammability question kind of comes, comes to play when, when you start to think about kind of a, this, like how, how does a, a project, say, uh, make itself out into the world. And um, I don't know, I, I've never heard of a developer like, or, or a client saying, like, we want, we want to be able to Instagram a, a project. All the time, every time, every time. Yeah. Yeah, I guess, I guess, yeah, like a, like a, a private client may not care about the Instagrammable moment of their, of their home or something, but, but, um, but yeah, for public projects, we get it every single, every single time. It's I mean, we did actually have to um, tell our client for the restaurant that things shouldn't be published before we, they are not built, yeah. just because it's very awkward when things get out there and they are not. You know, we show them a working model, like a quick snapshot, on, and text them that, and then like I don't know, a minute later, it's like on Instagram, and we were like, um, you know, hashtag architecture office, like, oh my god, no, like please don't associate us with that. Yeah. So, uh, so, but also with like certain. Promises we learned that we don't want to make any promises to people that we can't keep to various reasons along the process. So I think that that was like something we had to learn. Yeah, I mean, there, uh, the pace of architecture is, is so much slower, obviously, than say, like being able to upload an image. And, and it's, it's so much trickier, too, uh, in terms of, say, uh, being able to kind of navigate all of the, the kind of codes or, or the the, the responsibilities of, of putting something out there in the world, um, and, and I guess it's it's the same regardless of whether you're building something uh, at the scale of a, a New York City block or at, at the scale of a, a restaurant or, or even an installation, uh, a major installation. So um, I, I don't know. I, I think I think that's something that uh, we have to start to find ways to to engage and, and ways to start to. Um, um, yeah, as architects start to think about and speed, speed and and its and that its relationship to complexity uh, in in the architectural project. Okay, uh, just being mindful of time, uh, I think that was a great uh, closing question, um, and it definitely gave us all a lot to think about. For everyone, I want to encourage you guys to look, uh, take a look in the Marble Room for the exhibition um, and help yourselves to any leftover snacks we have. Thank you for coming.